So I want to welcome you. Um, great session today, and I think you'll be pleased with the, the talks and the speakers that we have. Uh, two very distinguished gentlemen sitting next to me here, and I read both their papers, and uh, they're stellar. So if you had a chance to read them, I'm, I hope you agree with that assessment. If you didn't have a chance, take, take a read after the, the conference. But they're going to talk a little bit about their papers, can't go into everything. They're kind of detailed papers with a lot of analytical data presented and very, very, very useful. So PMA, they, they gave me this topic. So I went on the web, figure out what, you know, what's, what's PMA? And I did, Google, Google, I did the Google search for it. So I uh, scanned on the page. So if you're here for any of these topics, uh, what showed up first was the Produce Marketing Association. Anybody here for that? <laughs> no? All right, that's good. What about the Precision Metal Forming Association? Anybody here from that? That's, OK, good. You're going to like the talks today. You just want to stay there. The Pacific Maritime Association showed up next. So, um, you know, we're not here for that. We're here for something much, much better. PMA is the, is the profile management application that's been defined and worked on for quite a while now inside of DOCSIS. And to be honest, this, my opinion, and I'm biased because I love this topic, uh, but I, I think this is going to be one of the uh, first really big, big applications of automation for us in the cable industry running our RF plants. And we've used automation before. It's, you know, that's not foreign to us. But this is big. This is going to be the, the system that goes out and continually monitors the network, looking at the signal-to-noise ratios, making some very intelligent decisions about how to change the profiles for each of the modems out there. And uh, it can feed that back instantly into the CMTSs and send that stuff down to the cable modems, and everybody kind of can change and operate optimally. Should be an incredible change to the, the performance and throughput of our systems. And depending on how quickly we do that feedback loop, um, you know, we can respond to anomalous uh, situations very quickly in the future. And I think it's going to be even more important when we get to DOCSIS 4.0, where we have broader spectra to manage. I don't think human beings really want to get involved in managing uh, OFTM and OFTMA profiles across 1.7 gigahertz of spectrum. So, so this is important. And I was talking to one of the operators yesterday, and they, they said, you know, I feel like we're in the dark ages. I don't even know how we're going to manage all this new DOCSIS, OFDM stuff, 1.8 gigahertz. And I said, not to worry, because PMA is going to do all this stuff for you. So that's the hope. That's the dream. So we're going to hear about that dream today. We have two great talks. The first talk is uh, uh, tutorial in nature, a lot of good, good uh, data be presented. The second talk is going to dive into some of the, the findings in the actual PMA implementation and some of the innovative ideas that came up with that approach. So, so I think you'll enjoy both of them. I'm going to start out with a talk by uh, Karthik Sundaresan. Karthik is a distinguished technologist at Cable Labs. He's a technical lead, longtime contributor. He's contributed incredible to an incredible number of uh, DOCSIS specs. Uh, he's focused on MAC, IP protocol, profile management, obviously. Low latency, SDN, NFV, and machine learning. And he's got an MSEE from the University of Colorado Boulder. And he's just generally a, a really nice guy. So please, please welcome Karthik. Thank you all. Thanks for uh, getting up here uh, first thing in the morning. I know who the hardcore DOCSIS 3.1 folks are. So they're in the room right here with me. All right. Um, Thanks to Jay, Mayank, and uh, James. They are my partners in crime uh, on this paper and uh, some of the testing at uh, Cable Labs. So I hope to talk about uh, three, uh, my agenda is kind of split into three topics, right? So downstream focused first. We spend a little bit of time on PMA and some of the practical gains we have seen with two different operators. And then we'll dive into upstream just to close off the topic. Um, in the downstream, I want to talk about, uh, we'll show you some field data, we'll look at some testing we did uh, at uh, Cable Labs, we did some with the Comcast folks down in Denver, um, and we'll come out with some of the results from that and recommendations from that, and uh, talk about uh, profile flapping. So, well, let's get right into it. Um, if your plant is nice and clean, the Per subcarrier, RXMER looks nice and clean. It's nice and flat across the whole channel. Um, and life is good. It's kind of boring, right? There's nothing much happening. Though there are plenty of modems which do see ingress noise from various sources. So the first example here is LTE ingress from 
over the air LTE channels, right? And the, the ingress aligns exactly to the frequencies we see in North America, all right? These are North American MSO uh, data. Uh, 740, 750 megahertz, they correspond to the uplink and downlink of the LTE channels, right? This is either a loose uh, uh, connection at a tab or at a, at a node, or maybe even some modems have bad shielding, which we have seen in our lab as well, right? So um, operators have left on their sweep generators, which kind of go across, uh, which is supposed to skip across the SC qualm channels, but they forgot to turn it off for the OFDM channels, and it kind of goes through the OFDM channels. That's what you see at the top left there. Um, at the bottom right is the is a RXMER and the roll off, right? That's kind of expected once you get past the 730, 740 megahertz mark, the MER kind of dives down. Um, there are other uh, weird things we see, I don't know for lack of a better word, uh, standing waves, uh, suck outs due to ingress noise, you know, tilt in the plant, uh, or which is not compensated for tilt correctly. Um, there are there are a lot of things which happen. Um, don't ask me how much of this, you know, is it 1% or is it 40%? Uh, it just depends on, a, on the plant and how well maintained that plant is, right? So uh, let's get into the, into the testing itself, right? Very simple, we're just sending upstream and downstream traffic, we're introducing some noise on the channel which I am uh, uh, testing uh, upstream or downstream and we're looking at FEC behavior, right? J let's, let's get a baseline first. Um, so the first observation was, uh, hey, can I just measure RxMER on a clean plant in the lab and see if things look different when data is on and when data is off um, and when I change modulation orders, right? So there's a minor variation. The RxMER measurements are done on the pilots. The data subcarriers next to it, uh, when they actually are carrying data, do tend to affect um, some of the RxMER measurement. It's not a big deal, but on an average, it's like one to two uh, to three dB. So let's get into more interesting test cases. So th this is the question which everyone is asking, is how good is the DOCSIS 3.1 system and how does it, uh, how does it help me, uh, how, how, how robust is it to code word errors, right? So we'll start with the gra uh, bar all the way to the left, right? And maybe that's a good, way, good place to start with two to six qualm. Um, at, if your MER is at about 40 to 50 dB, life is good, there's no uncorrectables, um, plant is working great. As I start in introducing more and more AWGN noise across the channel, I see the first corrected code word right around 33, 34 uh, dB MER, and then it starts ramping up pretty quickly, and at about 30, that's the end of the green bar. Hopefully you can see the, the arrows there. Um, that's when you start getting to 100% code word corrected. And then there's actually a chunk of time all the way down to 24, 25 dB, where you're still getting 100% code word corrected, but traffic is still flowing, life is good. Once you get past that 24 dB mark, I think then you start seeing a few uncorrectables, and, and then all the Mac layer stuff starts rolling into play. So, uh, and as you can expect, as the modulation order increases, um, that the threshold moves higher and higher, right? So for 4096 qualm, right off the bat, you're going to see un uh, you're going to see correctables, um, and then per the spec, once you get past. Uh, whatever the number is, 35 or so, then you start seeing the first uncorrectable. So this is the same um, graph in a different view. I, we try to draw some S-curves. Um, the main point of this is that range in which you go from the first corrected to 100% corrected is pretty, pretty steep, right? It's, it's just a few dB wide, and it ramps up very quickly. But once you get there, you can still stay at 100% corrected code words for quite a bit of time, right? That is kind of our takeaway. Um, again, as the qualm mo modulation levels uh, change, uh, the, uh, uh, the thresholds are, are higher and higher, and this kind of closely matches to what we have in the spec uh, as defined in the phi spec. So then we moved on to the next test case, which is trying to introduce some narrowband noise, right? So in this uh, top, top picture where we're, it's I think a one megahertz worth of noise, um, and we just started 
increasing the power on that lower and lower. And uh, the curve at the bottom is essentially the, n the percentage of corrected code words as that noise level increases. Um, again, the, the curve itself uh, goes up really steeply. And then if you can see uh, the corrected code words, they last for, say, 256 qualm, they last up to, you know, if that MER is down to 10 dB, you're still getting 100% uh, corrected code words, right? Uh, and after that is when you get the first uncorrectable. So the LDPC takes you a long way uh, once you get, uh, once you start getting correctable. So we, we did the test with multiple uh, widths of narrowband noise, and, um, um, and those are the curves, and you can look at that in, in the paper. Um, the next part, test was, okay, let's mimic some real life uh, scenarios. We captured some LTE signals of getting ingressing into the cable plant uh, off the air, uh, and then we replayed that for our testing. Uh, we also did some testing on a, with live LTE interference, so that was easy enough to do. Um, and uh, again, the thresholds for 1024 qualm are a little bit higher. Um, as you go lower down in modulation, the curves shift to the left, right? So kind of straightforward test cases would just to get us a feel for uh, how the system performs. Um, with, uh, we did the same test with three LTE channels, which we have seen, all, which we saw in the data as well, um, and uh, similar S-curve uh, behaviors o over time. The, the main takeaway for me with the LTE ingress was the ingress is at varying levels over time. So it, it almost is like an impulse into the plant at some point, and it's at that moment in time when there is an impulse of LTE noise is when the modem is not able to decode the code words and there is a set of code word errors, right? So we ran some tests where we turned on manually the LTE noise and for three of those we, we saw a bunch of uncorrectables in, in those spikes. But after a few, you know, 10, 20 milliseconds, those errors go away and, you know, the LDPC takes over and life is good again. Right, so there is definitely uh, an impact with that initial impulse noise. Um, so that's what this graph is trying to tell us. So the one thing um, I wanted to call out is, uh, which I think Matt talked about yesterday in his uh, D3.1 session, is the location of the PLC. So PLC is the, is the lifeblood of the DOCSIS 3.1 channel, and you want to make sure that it is in a good part of the spectrum. So in, in this example at the bottom, uh, you know, the PLC happened to be right over the LTE frequencies. I know that's where it is in my modem at home in Denver. Uh, and not a great location because that's where the, the LTE frequencies are for that lo location. So um, I think operators have done uh, a lot of analysis to figure out where those uh, LTE bands are and move the PLC out of it. And you can do the same analysis for other things, right? Move it out of the roll-off, move it out of other known ingress, things of that sort. Um, and then uh, the OFDM channel placement, of course, if you're in the roll-off, um, like we've just seen from the FEC testing that we did, um, if you have a flat profile, you're not going to be able to um, get robust operation, right? So you definitely want to have modulation profiles, and you want to ramp it down which, to match that MER. All right. So we looked at some data, uh, we looked at some test results. Um, I want to talk to you about CM status messaging, so Mac layer stuff. Um, this is when the modem sees some, a few code word errors, right? It's like in the LTE case we just looked at. It, it can't decode 10 code words in the last 100. It's going to raise a flag and say, hey, man, I'm in trouble. CM status message, Mr. CMTS, do something about it. And so. There are uh, multiple events defined. You know, if your OFDM profile fails, if your NCP profile fails, there are events for all sorts of stuff. Now, the way the modem detects that, uh, it could be based on a raw number of code words, right? 10 out of 100, or it could be based on time, right? Maybe the last two seconds out of uh, 10 where I, had, I saw some errors, so I'm going to flag it. So those thresholds are kind of modem proprietary, so make sure you work with your uh, uh, vendor to tweak those thresholds appropriately. Then the second part is the CMTS, right? When the CMTS gets the message, 
he's going to take some action on it. He's going to change the profile from, oh, you can't handle this high profile. I'm going to bump you down one layer lower. Right? And so there is a lot of uh, Mac layer settings on the CMTS. Um, and the CMTS has some hysteresis in reacting to the, to the data, uh, to the messaging coming from the, CM, uh, from the modems. And, and what that really leads to is this profile flapping. Right? So if you have a system where there is some intermittent noise, the modem sees some code errors, raises a flag, CMTS says, oh boy, you're in trouble, I'm going to downgrade you to a lower profile. Right? 30 seconds later, two minutes later, the modem says, oh, you know, I can decode the code words fine again. Let me, uh, I'm good on this profile. He sends the CM status recovery. And then the CMTS, after some X amount of time, whatever the recovery time is, he will bump him back to that uh, higher profile. Now, the key is these settings of timings of, you know, when do you get bumped back up to the higher profile? If that's long, I think some of the default settings we saw were like 60 minutes. So then what that ha means is even if you see a few errors, all, many of the modems come down to profile A, right? And then they're, you're not using, getting the optimum capacity out of, out of your network. So, and then you're kind of doing that profile flapping over time. So this is kind of the same uh, uh, profile flapping, but just in, in terms of uh, uh, code words uh, on the blue profile, at some point when the noise starts, the CMTS gracefully changes profile down to, the, to profile one and then to profile zero. And then when the, when the noise goes away, the modem sends a CM status recovery, and then traffic is back on, uh, on that first profile. So this is very repeatable, and this is kind of data from uh, some of the testing we did and some of the folks at Comcast did as well, of course. All right, so my recommendation is um, have the system behave with this philosophy. Fail fast and recover slowly. Right? So as soon as a modem sees a failure, you don't want the modem to be dropping code words and dropping packets. Right? You want the customer experience to be seamless. So you want him to report failures right away. And then when you, the only time you want to recover is when you're really sure, OK, life is good, the channel is stable, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recover. So uh, these are some of the recommended settings. Um, and we can talk offline if we want to get into some, of, some more of these details. Um, so this is on the modem side and how that does its reporting. And then the same similar settings on the CMTS side where you figure out um, what those recovery um, timers are and set those appropriately. All right. So hopefully that gives you a feel for how the plant behaves in the downstream. Uh, let's talk quickly about PMA. So PMA is the solution to not get into this profile flapping behavior, right? It is something which gets you, you design a profile around the ingress noise, and then you can, you have stable behavior. So the architecture is at a very high level. You know, you have a, modems upload their data to a data lake. Um, PMA uses the data from that data lake, creates uh, optimal profile assignments, and pushes that down, down to the CMTS. Um, I won't get into the software architecture today. I think uh, the, the blue box is the PMA software, the, the orange is the data collection, and the modem and CMTS at the bottom. Um, but we can, you can read the paper or we can talk offline in terms of uh, how, how to implement uh, some of these pieces. So let's get into the more interesting part, right? This is the gains I see from designing custom profiles. Um, you know, which works around the LTE noise or which works in the roll off and things of that sort, right? Um, and this is a standard curve. You'd see the PMA gain, which goes um, as the number of profiles increase, right? I can customize profiles to different sets of modems, right? One set of modems may be seeing LTE ingress, other sets of modems may be in the roll off. I can create separate profiles for them and I can get better robustness and get better capacity, right? So as I increase uh, the number of profiles, the gain in capacity starts leveling off, right? Um, and that's, it's intuitive. Um, and at some point, when you get past a certain number of profiles, what I call here recommended number of profiles, the gain is only, you know, one more profile gets me 0.2% increase in capacity. So then maybe it's not, it's a decision as an operator to make, wh where do I want to stop? So, um, that's that. So what, we got a bunch of data from different operators. 
Um, in this data set, we have 140 OFDM channels. We have uh, anywhere from 300 to 200 modems. Some had about 100 modems, uh, D31 modems on the channel. Um, and then we ran that PMA algorithm and figured out an optimal set of profiles, uh, or for different number of profiles, figure out what the gains would be, right? So some channels here, this is with three profiles. I think one of the CMTS vendors supports three profiles off the bat. Um, some of the uh, profiles are in the 10% uh, gain, others are in the 40 to 50% gain, right? So as I increase the number of profiles, the, the histogram kind of shifts to the right. Um, just as a simple comparison between um, two profiles and 10 profiles, right? You, you move from a gain of 25% to 36%. A again, uh, the gain number is relative to running everything at 256 squam, right? I need a baseline to compare against, so that, that's my baseline. All right, the uh, recommended number of profiles, this is another question which comes up, you know, how many profiles should a CMTS support? Uh, the modem supports four uh, per the spec, so we're set there. Um, so we ran that, the, the PMA algorithm, and on different thresholds, right, where the, where the threshold is, if I add one more profile, how much more gain do I get? And that threshold, if I set it to 1%, half a percent, or 0.25%, um, that's, those are the three curves here. So if I set it to a 1% gain, I can cover most of the cases in green um, if I have anywhere from eight to 10 profiles. So from more and more of the data that I'm seeing from, from Comcast, from Shaw, um, that seems to be the sweet spot, right? So, okay, so. That's that on uh, PMA and the, and the gains there. I think uh, Maher will talk more about uh, some of the algorithms. Um, and you know, I think Greg and I had a paper a few years ago where we came up with a set of algorithms which, uh, which was a good starting point as well. All right, so lastly, I don't wanna leave uh, upstream. Um, uh, I wanna give it some love. Um, there are a few operators who are turning on upstream. Um, I'm working with folks mainly in Europe uh, who are farther along, um, given that they have a 85 megahertz uh, split and a uh, few others have even a 204 split. So um, we are starting work on upstream and upstream PMA. Uh, a few notes on the upstream uh, in terms of channel configuration. I think you have to figure out if you want to do time and frequency division multiplexing or not, right? Um, there's definitely the implementations on the CMPS side uh, are, are still maturing, so there's definitely a cost to switching between a D31 only mode versus 3.1 and 3.0 together and 3.0 SEQAM only, right? So um, your mileage may vary, right? Um, and mo many operators, after trying the time and frequency division multiplexing, have decided we're just going to go. Keep, give them separate spectrum for my SCQAM upstreams versus OFDMA upstreams. Um, again, the configuration is important. Uh, there's um, return sweep frequencies in the lower part of the spectrum. The lower part of the spectrum in the upstream is just noisy, anywhere from five to 20. So a lot of the operators like NOS and Portugal have moved their starting point to 22 megahertz. I think Vodafone did it to 22 or 23. Um, you know, you have the, the blocking and tackling for upstream configuration. Again, there, there's a lot of parameters which you need to um, be aware of, right? So more back on the, on the vein of PMA and uh, channel evaluation. Um, the CMTS has a couple of ways to uh, evaluate an upstream uh, channel, right? Uh, one is doing upstream probes and getting an RxMER measurement out of that. Uh, and the other is doing asking a modem to send some test code words uh, on a certain profile and then measuring the FEC stats on that, right? Corrected, uncorrected. So uh, the CMTS really can do this whole profile management business just like it did in the downstream, right? In the downstream, the modem sent up the measurements um, and then the, the, the CMTS can, and the modem sends up CM status messages, right? Here on the, on the upstream, the CMTS is the receiver, so he's got to figure out, is this profile working okay or not, and do I need to change it, and things of that sort. So he could do that based on a simple code word error rate, um, or he could do it on the actual MER value as he, uh, as he measures it on the upstream. 
right? So there is a very similar profile flapping issue like we saw in the downstream in the upstream as well, right? In the upstream, I think uh, the problem is a little tougher because the modem only supports two profiles for the spec, uh, and the CMTS supports seven. Um, and so profile 13 is kind of the baseline profile, and then the, uh, any other profile, say profile 12, is, is a customized profile. And then if a modem s s uh, has upstream errors on a particular, ups uh, on, a, on say profile 12, then the CMTS has to say, oh, this modem is having trouble, I need to give it a different profile, say profile 11, he's got to shift all the traffic to profile 13 for those 100, 200, uh, maybe 1,000 microseconds, or milliseconds, and so then there, it's kind of a varying upstream capacity, right? So it's a very similar problem um, and a little more, more challenging on the upstream. So on the downstream, Modems very reliably send up data, RxMER measurements for OFDM channels. For OFDMA channels, I think we are having trouble, uh, or, or the gap is where we need the CMTSs to do the measurement and send that out to my data lake or to the PMA, right? And so today we are working with the CLI clients. We have kind of built CLI agents to go you know, essentially get the RxMER measurements out of the CLI and, and then use that in for, for a PMA. Um, I think to scale the solution, that, that definitely is, uh, is something we'd, we'd need to uh, get more support on from, from the CMTS side. So, um, there, and there are weird things like uh, measuring RxMER with no other traffic on the plant versus measuring traffic with multiple modems transmitting. Uh, things are uh, a little bit more dynamic, and um, I'm still doing a lot of testing, both at Cable Labs and with our MSO partners, so more to come there. So one thing, um, I know I'm just at time, Tom, uh, uh, which, so we, we did similar tests in the upstream like we did in the downstream, right? Increase the noise level and um, kind of see uh, how the FEC codewords uh, do. Um, and we see a, a similar S-curve, right? It actually is an S-curve here as opposed to the downstream, which was very, very sharp, right? So um, as you increase the, uh, the noise, the, uh, uncorrect the correctables go up, and then once you reach 100% correctable, you, the uncorrectables start going up, right? And we did this for different modulation orders and different pilot patterns, um, and uh, the only thing was the the range from going from z uh, you know zero percent uh, corrected to hundred percent corrected was much wider than it is in the downstream, but once you get to hundred percent correct, corrected, you're going into uncorrectable in the upstream. So the the behavior is slightly different. Uh, we we did some testing, similar testing. We introduced some narrowband noise. Uh, in the upstream, and you know, we started seeing code word loss uh, uh, or packet loss in this case, you know, 40%, 60%. And, and the simple test which we ran was, you know, create an upstream profile which works around that five megahertz noise that we were introducing, and the performance was back to when we were having, you know, no noise on the plant. So this was just a kind of proof of concept. Uh, that's what the NOS folks are doing, trying to prove out, hey, does PMA work on the upstream as well? at a very baseline level, it does work, right? So I'll, I'll finish there. I think uh, the file layer and Mac layer configuration for DOCSIS 3.1, both OFDM and OFDMA are very important. Uh, there are definitely fine Mac layer settings that we need to be aware of. Um, PMA definitely provides you that robustness if you have modems on the plant which are having all those weird ingress noise issues we star saw at the start. Uh, and uh, additional profiles on the CMTS is definitely needed both in the downstream and upstream just to customize those profiles and kind of increase the overall capacity. Um, and in the upstream, uh, again, more dynamic environment, so PMA is more, <coughs> is more important. So I'll pause there. We'll take questions at the end. There's a question out here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. Um, our second talk is going to dive into some of the uh, some of the details about an actual implementation. And once 
I get this going here. There we go. Uh, the speaker is uh, Maher Harb. And uh, Maher is a, a senior principal data scientist at Comcast. His interests are in applying machine learning algorithms to uh, various problems in the digital signal processing space. He's a technical lead on the PMA project right now. And he has a PhD in physics and was previously a professor at Drexel University for a bunch of years. And he just joined the cable industry in the last year. So uh, based on the work that he's done here, I'm, I'm excited to uh, get a chance to work with him. And I, I think you guys will as well. So with that, please uh, welcome Maher. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let's okay, yeah. So I will I will go over uh, like Comcast journey into deploying developing an uh, PMA algorithm and deploying that uh, algorithm. And uh, I agonized a bit into like what information to include because there are many like good things to add here. I wanted to share, but you know it, uh, through like 20 minute presentation it's not possible. So I really like to refer you to the technical paper. It's very detailed. Uh, it's close to 50 pages in length, so you can go in and see, like, um, get more details on the algorithm and also the data uh, infrastructure. Uh, so I'd like to start with this motivating uh, sort of analysis we looked into early, uh, early on in the process. And what you're seeing here is the MER distribution at the subcarrier level across the whole uh, network of uh, DOCSIS 3.1 devices in, in Comcast. So we have few millions of devices, and you know, that translates into few billions of uh, subcarriers. And you can see immediately that the network, you know, is healthy enough to support, uh, you know, higher modulation than that, you know, baseline 256 QAM that is offered by DOCSIS 3.0. And one can argue here that it's probably that you don't need profiles. Like you can, you know, you can implement flat, uh, flat profiles rather than customized. But I challenge you to think of how wide the OVM spectrum is. And you've seen Kartik's talk. And what, how likely it is that you get really a clean MER spectrum for all the devices in, in your network. Uh, so this is really the motivation for going into a customizable uh, solution. One another interesting like, piece of analysis related to this distribution here. If you calculate uh, like what is the ceiling in terms of being able to assign the right modulation to every subcarrier, you get a figure of about 40% increase in, in capacity based on this distribution. And this is still conservative in the sense it's not really a theoretical limit because we're assuming a certain mapping between MER and modulation that is conservative in nature. I think we can, we can uh, you know, add three to six decibels of additional uh, you know, offset to these uh, thresholds. So this is mainly the, the motivation. So what I'd like to do next is I'd like to spend some time explaining this figure here because it will come across uh, over and over again. This is how we represent uh, MER of devices and, and the profiles. So what you're seeing here is a set of 21 devices. They're all connected to the same of them interface. So each panel here is a cable modem. And you have two pieces of information on this uh, figure. You have the MER shown in, uh, in light green. And you have the profile assigned to that modem shown as a solid line uh, in this curve. And in this, I picked a rather healthy, healthy OFDM interface. So you can see that you know, all the devices except one have flat MER that can support uh, close to uh, 4096 QAM, except for this modem CM84 that has some ingress in the, in the spectrum. And the idea here is that we need some customization in order to match like, the profiles to the, to the uh, state of the spectrum. OK, so this is a first cut naive approach to the problem. Like, this is like what you, you one could you know, immediately think of. You can measure MER. You can run some clustering algorithm where you, you know, bunch together modems that have similar characteristics together. And then you can assign them a profile by looking at the, you know, considering the MER across every uh, OFDM subcarrier and taking the minimum value for that cluster. And the next step, you can convert that into a modulation using this, uh, this mapping, which is as I said, conservative. And there's some underlying assumption here that we have good understanding of the theory in terms of, you know, at a given modulation for a given MER, there's some uh, probability of uh, generating an error in the symbol. Uh, so this is the curve that you see uh, on the right side. Okay, so this is the naive approach. And if we apply that approach, you get something like, like this. So uh, again, exactly the same set of 21 devices. But now I assigned five profiles to these uh, devices. 
And uh, you can see, for example, uh, this is a bunch of devices assigned to profile one. This is profile two, uh, three, four. And then finally, the impaired modem uh, got assigned its own, uh, its own profile. So this is like really the first approach or the first, cut, uh, first try. So two comments here. Uh, like you can, first of all, you can gain some capacity, of course, because you went from 256 to close to you know, 40, 96. But you can question, for example, you know, the need for five profiles. Three of these profiles are very similar. Uh, I think uh, one, uh, three, and four, they are mostly flat, except for a few subcarriers. And then the second, you know, more interesting question, are we really like assigning profiles that are persistent in time, or are we just generating something that follows the noise in the measurement? So how, how stable these profiles are? So these are like questions or thoughts that I would like you to hold on to, and you, you know, will try to address these. So let's now discuss why, why is this problem more challenging than this like, very uh, naive way to, uh, you know, to, to approach the problem. And I put some thoughts here. I'm just going to like, quickly like, highlight these. One, you have the vendor constraints. Not all the vendors implement the same uh, constraints on the number of profiles and over even the shape of the segments that you can construct. We have the time dimension. This is really core to the problem. Uh, what happens to MER as it changes in time? How fast are the changes? Are we missing some? intermittent uh, impairments in the, in the spectrum. Uh, we have the whole engineering aspect, building a machine learning pipeline that is efficient and scales um, you know, to, the, to cover like the whole 3.1 devices that uh, are, in, for example, in Comcast network. This is a uh, you know, challenging task. We have the error correction dimension. Uh, of course, we can apply profiles, but how good are they? Can we measure, can we measure a response? Are we too conservative, too aggressive? You know, we have to think about these uh, issues. Uh, the whole effort around metrics and validation, how, you do, how do we validate the profiles? How do we run uh, like a program to track metrics in real time and be able to respond if there's something that you know, doesn't look uh, right? Uh, the operation side of things, like tying the program to the you know, uh, operational teams in the, uh, in the, at Comcast. Um, we have also the business consideration. Uh, it's not purely algorithmic here because you can, you know, uh, you can override certain choices that the algorithm made in certain regions uh, on based on some requests. Uh, we, can all, we have also to consider questions like how, how often do we, apply, uh, do we update the profiles? Is it disruptive? Like, uh, and you know, do we need to mitigate that uh, in some fashion? Uh, and then there's also the discovery process, like the interesting question about you know, how, how good is our knowledge of the sensitivities around FEC? Uh, can we add or subtract few decibels from the threshold table? So these are all the questions that we, you know, we tried to address through the pipeline that we ended up building at Comcast. And I will you know, show you highlights from each. Uh, I'll start by showing just the overview of the solution architecture. So this is like a systems view. Uh, and mainly there are three systems. There's a data engine. It, it is responsible for collecting telemetry data, both from the CMTS and the devices. And it gets this data, it lands it in a data lake. Uh, uh, we have the analytics engine. It taps into this data. And it runs the algorithms. It generates profiles. And then finally, we have the configuration manager. The config configuration manager takes these profiles, which are agnostic to the vendor, and translates them into specific CLI commands. It, does, it transacts these profiles and gets confirmation. So it's really ultimately responsible for the success or, or failure of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of applying the profiles. These are some of the you know, tools or technologies we use. I'm not going to spend too much time here on, on this, but I'm uh, just going to comment that uh, for the most part, the whole solution is in the public cloud. So it's not you know, you know, mostly really the standard uh, you know, public platforms that are available today uh, for doing you know, efficient computing in a distributed environment. So let me go in a bit about and uh, zoom in into the analytics engine piece, because this is the interesting one where the algorithms live and show you just some of the main functions. Um, first, you have some data sources. Uh, these include the network topology, so linking the modem lineage, linking a modem to an interface to a CMTS. Uh, we have all the of, of the interface configurations, including like the location of the PLC channel, the NCP profile modulation. Uh, we have information on the CMTSs, uh, the make model vendor uh, software hardware version, like all the information we need to trace that. Uh, telemetry data is really the core data. This is the MER and FEC data. 
And then finally, we have a table uh, maintaining a set of constraints that are currently up to date uh, implement as implemented by the vendors. So it links every um, version, hardware and software version of CMTS to how many profiles is, is it able to support, what, how many segments, uh, are there like requirements, additional requirements on the segmentation. Uh, the first step in the algorithm is taking all this data and you know, transforming the data and you know, putting together a modeling data set where every row is a, uh, represents an observational unit corresponding to an interface and you have certain columns that are features required for the algorithm to run. And after that we have two processes that kick off in parallel. We have a pattern detection, a host of pattern detection algorithms and uh, we have the you know, PMA uh, profile generation algorithms. And I put pattern detection here because it really, f there's a, you know, currently a weak link, but there's a feedback or link between the pattern detection and uh, uh, profile generation. I'll give you an example. If we determine that a modem is severely impaired that we would, do not wish to waste a profile on, we can flag that modem and then we can remove it from the clustering so that it doesn't like, impact, uh, negatively impact the capacity gain that we hope to achieve. So this is one example. We have also something, just following on Karthik's talk, we have also a pattern detection algorithm to detect, uh, to recommend a PLC position based on the impairments in that uh, interface. So following profile generation, we have a host of different uh, processes that run in parallel. We validate the output. We generate a standardized JSON formatted output for the profiles. Uh, we generate some metrics, you know, the capacity, how many segments, all the you know, interesting metrics that we wish to track. Uh, we generate some tables that are designed for building dashboards to track things and you know, diff using different solutions. And then finally, there are some uh, notification uh, processes that kick off that notify configuration manager that the profiles are ready. You can now transact uh, these profiles. So I'm going to dive in next into the time dimension because I think this is the most interesting challenge or the most technically interesting challenge about, about the problem. And I start by showing this. Uh, this is a distribution of the range of MER variation over a period of 10 days. So we picked a CMTS, randomly sampled one CMTS, and every, every row in this plot is a distribution corresponding to an interface. It's a bit busy, but the main message here, or like the two main features are the following. On average, you have about 3 dB variation in MER. And this could, you know, could be interpreted as either uh, like some inherent noise in the measurement, or this is the fluctuation in AR over like, uh, due to changes in temperature over the course of the, of the day. Uh, but we also have outliers. You can see that some, some of the data go as far as 20 dB. So these are really the, the, the impairments that, uh, that show up and disappear uh, over the course of the time period of, you know, of 10 days here. And these are like the tricky ones that we need to deal with. So one question is like, what's the impact of this variation on on profile, like on assigning profiles. This is another analysis here looking into, if we start in day zero, assigning profiles based on a point in time MER, what happens as we go in, in time? Like how many of these uh, subcarriers retain the same recommendation? And you can see that the you know, number drops sharply, even by day one, you go down to 82%, and then by 10 days, it's close to 75%. So we really need to consider the time, uh, the time dimension here. So here's this, our solution or our like uh, how we think tend to think about uh, including time dimension. Um, I'm going to show you first the two modems, uh, two modems here, CM84 and CM95. Uh, I will zoom in and show you some of the time series. So this is CM84. Uh, this is a different view now. It's the same modem, but every panel is a is a time sample, and they're separated by four hours. Uh, so this is the frequency of of sampling, and you can see that you have the same ingress everywhere, uh, but the level changes. And sometimes you see a different uh, feature, for example, distortion here or amplitude ripple that appears in one sample but not uh, others. This is uh, s the other modem CM95. This one is more pro problematic because we started with having a healthy flat MER, but then in some of the time samples we have uh, some pattern here. I think it's a suck out. But again, like imagine not capturing this pattern uh, when, you're, when we're building the profile. So it, it's really critical. So here's what we do. Um, switching back to the same view where we have the 21 devices. Uh, this time I'm not showing any profiles, but I show you um, all the time samples overlaid on top of each other. So for this uh, modem CM84, we have 32 time samples. Uh, if you plot them all on top of each other, you have this green, thick green band. So this is how you know, it helps solve uh, 
think about the problem in a different way. So you can think now at, that at every subcarrier you have a distribution of MER values. And by having a decision boundary, you can select one value to, be, to represent the distribution. And in this case, we selected the 10th percentile. So the, uh, the solid line that runs through the distribution is really like uh, capturing the 10th percentile within distribution. And it's a, so it's a good starting point because it's, uh, it's conservative, but at the same time, it leaves out some of the outliers in the, in the data. Same thing for CM95. You can see the 10th percentile tracking uh, sort of going through the band, but uh, leaving out these two extreme, uh, extreme samples. Okay, so, so we have, it means that we have some ability to tune uh, sort of the, these values to get a certain, to achieve a certain result. So we have these three tuning parameters. We have the MER consideration period, how, how, you know, how long in time we, we fetch MER time samples. Uh, if you make it larger, this, uh, th this green band becomes thicker. If you make it smaller, it becomes thinner. We have the percentile, which is the decision boundary. So it's, it's the line within the, uh, within the band. And then we have a third one. It's not as influential, but we can also restrict the number of samples, maximum number of samples. So if I set it to one in the extreme case, I would be looking only at the point in time MER. So these are three tuning par parameters that are available to us. So now let's take these and look at you know, the whole end-to-end -end algorithm that we implemented uh, at Comcast. So we start by processing the time samples, as I you know, explained to you. We cluster the devices uh, according to the possible number of profiles uh, for a given interface. Uh, then we construct the profiles by looking at the minimum value across each, uh, across each cluster for each uh, subcarrier. And next, we segment the profiles. And this is as something we initially we didn't think that is needed. But it turns out that there are constraints from the vendors on how you know, many different contiguous blocks of uh, modulation you can use. So um, you know, we, we have some algorithm that is described in, uh, in detail in the technical paper that we apply to uh, generate these segments. And then finally, we do some consolidation of the profiles or pruning of the profiles. Again, this is something related to the vendors. Some of the vendors not only constrain the number of profiles on the interface level, but also at the CMTS level globally. So we have to go back and do some accounting, you know, looking you know, for if we violate that uh, you know, unique number of profiles, we have to do some pruning. So this is the end-to-end -end, um, process. I'll show you some of the, you know, if we apply this pipeline, um, same 21 modems, you get these profiles here. But this time, we're, you know, we're, we're, segment, we're uh, clustering not on the point in time MER, but on the uh, 10th percentile. Okay, and this is pre-segmentation. I will apply now the segmentation, and you will see what you see when I apply the segmentation uh, is that we reduce we reduce the number of uh, you know number of segments that you that you see. So it maybe smooths a bit uh, these uh, these profile curves. Uh, yeah. So next, I will show you some analysis sensitivity analysis that we did. So looking into varying you know three or four things: the percentile, like the decision boundary the consideration period over which we collect MER, the global offset, if we move the threshold you know, that transforms MER into modulation by three plus or minus three dB, and then we look at the capacity. And the results are, you know, they are intuitive. Of course, if you reduce the threshold, you, you, know, you get a bump up in, in capacity. Likewise, if you, uh, you know, become more uh, conservative, you, you, you lose capacity. So today we are operating at, uh, at this point here, roughly. But we think that we can go, you know, we can go further. Uh, but there's one really important and missing component here. Of course, it's uh, trivial to think that if you reduce the threshold, you can get more capacity. But what happens to the resiliency? So the question that we're trying to address currently is uh, being able to accurately measure FEC, like the error rates, uncorrectables and correctables, and use that as a feedback signal so that it informs like the right, you know, how we move on this curve in order to get the right balance between capacity gain and resiliency. So this is something we're, uh, we're working on. And we have made like, good uh, progress. Uh, so supporting this effort is actually a lab that we you know, <coughs> established uh, that is really dedicated to testing uh, the PMA pipeline and apply application of profiles. And you know, one of the main innovations in the lab is the ability to take observed MER uh, values in the field and using software, RF software, regenerate the impairment, apply it to the devices, and then test you know, the outcome. Uh, I will show you one of the very first uh, sort of validations or uh, testing on, of, uh, of PMA done in this uh, setting. So what you see here, are th there are three sort of curves here. You start with a baseline. So we have 12 modems, healthy MER, 
they're all operating on profile three, which has the highest modulation level. Then we introduce impairments to six of the modems. So we have the control group and then the, the impaired group. When you do that, you see immediately that the impaired modems now are, work, are operating at profile zero <coughs> because they're impaired. And then at, you know, uh, automatically the pipeline is running. It recommends some profiles. And once you apply the profiles, these modems recover. And you can see it in the fact data. So this, this uh, figure on the very uh, right, uh, you know, far right, it's a bit uh, difficult to, to see. But uh, there are two crossover points in the in unicast octets that we're looking at for one of the modems. There is one crossover point when the modem is impaired. So it goes from profile 3 to 0. And then another cross point, a crossover point when you, know, you apply the new profiles and it recovers back to the, to the higher capacity profile. So this was one of the very early testing we did. We, we have since then we have then done additional testing in the field in a true like uh, you know traffic setting. Uh. And then finally, I, I would like to comment a bit on pattern detection. Pattern detection is an important component to PMA because PMA will will mask any problems that exist in the network in terms of the customer not being aware of you know having any impairments and calling you know calling customer support. So we'd like to in parallel to PMA, we'd like to be aware about that these patterns. So we have two algorithms uh, based on uh, you know, the work done in Cable Labs. We took some of their algorithms and we evolved these so that uh, we can detect both LTE and non-LTE interference. And we you know, tie that to sort of the capacity in the field to, correct, to address these issues. Mm -hmm. So we have some, something we call the top end list of uh, impairments for, by region that we send it like weekly. And then we try to you know, uh, see if they address these issues so that the network keeps incrementally improving over, over time. And you know, we don't mask the problems uh, by PMA. So this is what I wanted to share. Just a final comment on the future work. Uh, with, you know, the really big uh, sort of objective is trying to operate in an adaptive closed loop configuration where we measure FEC and then uh, move the thresholds to you know, gain more capacity. Uh, strengthening this link between pattern detection and PMA. Currently, it's only about severely impaired modems, but it could inform PMA in different ways. Uh, doing all sorts of pipeline optimizations to you know, have it f run more efficiently. Uh, this is something we always like uh, you know, incrementally uh, work on. And then we, s we will start like very soon looking into PMA for the upstream. Uh, you know, so collecting or doing all the telemetry collection for the upstream and uh, you know, thinking about how can we approach this problem for the upstream. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maher. So, what do you think? Was I right, or was I right? Those are kind of those are pretty good talks, right? And the papers are, are just as good. Um, so uh, we're at that time where you get a chance to ask some questions. I've noticed people have been really shy this show so far. You guys don't look shy to me, though. Are you guys shy? Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I think um, based on what, mo like in the graphs I said, for 49.6 and 20.48, I think even at higher than 40 dB MER, there's always a a a uh, code word correction. Absolutely. So, like I think Ron Rannick mentioned it yesterday. What's that? Right. Right. Well, the profile will start changing only if you get uncorrectables, right? So. Essentially, correctables in a DOCSIS 3.1 networks, I mean, I don't want to say it's a don't care, but don't freak out about it, right? I mean, if you're down in that threshold region is when you need to worry about it, because then the profile flapping will start happening. Following up on that, go ahead. Go ahead. Even down to
Right. Is, isn't I, I mean my understanding is that in L, in LDPC like having correctable errors is is like normal part of the operation. You shouldn't like worry too much about correctable errors. That's sort of what I was uh, taught to think of like that that issue. And that's support like that's supported by the by the very sharp uh, transition, right? Right. Because in the Reed Solomon, you have like more more flat, like more uh, linear transition between like uh, error regime and non errors, whereas here it's an S, like very sharp drop, right? So that's right. Uh, but it makes it challenging, like to be able to detect because you, if you're like trying to be adaptive, you're not gonna get a very strong signal. You're, you you fall off the cliff very quickly, so it makes it challenging from the control like your loop perspective, like how do you detect the signal before like you fall off the cliff? <laughs> right, yeah, again, uh, uncorrectables is what causes changes in, you know, partial service or partial channel type operations. If you're in the corrected range, you're okay. Um, and, and the specific answer to your question, it may be some sort of impulse, you know, discrete event of noise coming into the plant which always seems to create some sort of, uh, of a few set of uncorrectables, which may be what you're seeing. Rich? Yeah, so I have a question about, you know, in the downstream, you can determine that the code word is uncorrectable because you have a, uh, an algebraic code which um, will detect errors like the CRC. In the upstream, the LDPC is, uh, there's no, uh, it's, it's a straightforward LDPC. And what you get is, uh, without parry check, you, it's unreliable. But you can't determine if it's uncorrectable um, because that would require maximum likelihood of coding, which would be impossible for, for making something that you, you would actually apply. So how do you determine if it's uncorrectable in the upstream? Do you have to go to the multi-layer and check the CRC on the Ethernet frame and mark all the code words? Or do you just call an unreliable code word an uncorrectable right yeah yeah we did the testing with both um, at least trusting the CMTS FEC numbers as much as we could um, and we also did a, you know, just how many packets we lost, right? So both at the IP layer as well as at the MAC layer. Um, so I don't, I don't know which uh, implementation or what, what numbers the CMTSs are reporting today. So I'll have to, I'll have to find out. You just give up, you right? Right. Yeah, at least in some of the initial testing, the we were losing some packets. It also depends on where the noise is and where the code word lay, you know, fell in the upstream and if it got affected or not, and you know. In, right. Yeah, you're trying to optimize, you. yeah. Very good. Anybody else have a question? We have time for maybe one more. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, from an operations add-on, is there a correlation with the DMA between trouble calls as far as improvements? Um, because I know we talked a lot about capacity, but the user experience is probably more of a focus than the capacity at this point, because as you ramp up 3 all one it's kind of slow for that capacity usage. So, do you guys have we 
we don't have data, but we're like right now the effort is really focused on building the right uh, sort of co cockpit view of the network and uh, having the, the truck uh, the trouble calls or truck rolls will be one of the metrics. So we'd like really to to see the you know uh, to track this metric and see if implementing PMA has an effect because I know the capacity is you know an easy one to move, but did you like really improve the resiliency and does it manifest in better customer experience? It's something we, we, we will definitely track, and this is part of like the dashboarding and metric and you know F validation effort that we're currently focused on. But we don't have data like showing uh, going back in time because we haven't really implemented PMA yet in the truth in the field, right? Yeah. 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 Right, and, and I think the one other metric is that CM status message from the modems, where the modem says, "I'm in trouble." If you can track that on the CMTS side to see how many CM status messages were there with flat profiles, and then you turn on PMA, and then you see how many CM status messages come up, then that'll at least give you a feel for some improvements that you made. Yeah, that would actually be my question too. Um, so with that CM status message, your lab experience, do you guys do customer experience testing as far as the you know, your voice you know, insertion does to that customer traffic? Yeah. Right. So we did that in the upstream. I don't have this uh, experiments on the downstream, but we did see traffic loss on the downstream, right? So I mean, all of this kind of started with you know some of the folks at Comcast kind of reaching out, saying there are you know customer calls, and we wanted to get to the bottom of it, right? So th there are so many layers to this that by the time it affects the customer experience, and by the time they pick up the phone and call <laughs> call the operator, um, then it's a really bad issue, right? Whereas some of these are more intermittent. So, but, but I think you're right on. I think those are the stats that we, I think every operator would need to track and, uh, and correlate and see if, how much of a difference it made. And just a follow up on this question. In the technical paper, like, uh, we, we, we do like show that uh, reduction in trouble calls, but it wasn't really done in a scientific way where you can correlate it to one like effort. It was all under the umbrella of the DOXA 3.1 hardening where, where we changed the PLC location, we addressed the flapping problem, we reduced the band bandwidth where you had like roll off. So all these efforts reduced the, the trouble calls, but it was done all in one like in one you know, effort as the DOXA 3.1, yeah. yeah. Okay. Guys, unfortunately we're out of time. It went quick. so. Um Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you enjoy the rest of the show. Please join me in, thank in thanking the speakers. <laughs>